The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. for the most difficult message you've ever heard? Yes. Sir. Okay. Well, I'm glad Tom's ready. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I believe the challenge for the days ahead for hard times is your spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity or coming under full stature has its challenges. And I believe that God wants to teach us how to become a supernatural expression, not a religious person that has all the right answers, but how to become a supernatural expression. And the verse that keeps uh, repeating itself again and again and again is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. And many, many know this in the short version. The short version is, for the kingdom of God is not in a word, but in power. Everyone's heard that, correct? The kingdom of God is not in talk, but power. The interesting thing there, however, is that in the Amplified, it basically says, moral power and excellence of soul. Say that back to me. Moral power power and excellence of soul. So what is that saying? This was written to the Corinthians. They were behind in no gift. All right. They had the gifts. What was the problem with the Corinthian church was their character, right? And so when he's saying that the demonstration of the kingdom of God would be not just in word or talk, but power. And he even said, I'm going to come and I'm going to see those who think there's something and see how much power they have. And people have a tendency to think only the signs and wonders. You can move in the gifts and still be, have character deficiency. He wanted to see how much power do they have that's coming from the character and the nature of God. Do they have an excellent spirit like Daniel? Do they have a different spirit like Joshua and Caleb? Do they have the substance of the nature and the character of God in their life? Do they have that kind of moral power or excellence of soul. And I believe that what God is laying out for us in preparation for the days ahead, and like I said, this is not going to be an easy message, but I think this is something that we should take notes on and take it home and literally ponder if we're going to uh, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, there were seven major revelations that God had given me over a period of six months, life-changing revelations, life-changing God encounters. The last one, or the seventh, produced uh, something in me, and that was that, I'm not going to go into the other six, you're just going to get number seven today. Number seven was demonstration, that God basically says you've got to have a life message, you've got to live what you Walk the talk is the way we used to say it, right? Walk the talk. And he basically said that your life witness is a demonstration and that the very purpose of the congregation or God's people or the church, church is actually better translated congregation. And the purpose is that through that church, the complicated multifaceted, many-sided, manifold wisdom of God, like a beautiful rainbow that never ends, colors that are without ending. That manifold expression is being made known to principalities and powers. But I've got news for you. If you've got a lot of religion or you've got a lot of Bible knowledge, that is declaring nothing in the heavenlies. To reflect in the heavenlies must be the revelation that has shined upon your heart that you have taken to heart and are now mirroring or reflecting that same truth. Otherwise, it says nothing to principalities and powers. Isn't it true that it must be transformation or it declares nothing? God says, this gospel shall be preached through all the world. He goes, no, it should be demonstrated throughout all the world, then the end will come. You've got to live it. You can't just talk it. It can't be in lip service, but in demonstration of moral excellence and 
excellence of soul, moral power, moral power, a changed life. Isn't it true that the angels rejoice in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance? But you realize when one sinner comes to repentance, when one person gets born again, that when they're born again, there's a supernatural transaction that takes place that mirrors into the heavenly. It's, a, it's reality that mirrors. Not religion, not good deeds, but what's mirrored is life transformation. And God says, I want you to be a full, fullness people, a supernatural expression, a transfigured fullness people that are mirroring the life change. And I saw that God was basically saying, you know, Dennis, I've taken you through these other six revelations, but this seventh revelation was basically, I'm going to take this truth that you need to be a life message. And I'm going to take that truth. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that truth. I'm going to teach you that this gospel needs demonstrated, that it's going to require an attitude in your heart to work in unity. Because God says part of the mirroring is to the degree you can work in unity, to the degree you work in coveting, comparing, or competing, you work in disunity. You work against the cause of God. But God's basically saying that, Father, I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Mirroring unity is going to have to be part of your witness. And that means that you can't just say, oh, I'm close to God. I've got this great relationship with God. It's these people that are ignorant and I can't get along with. All right, that's not going to work because he's going to say no. What's going to be mirrored is not only the transformation of your born-again experience and the subsequent sanctification and growth in the spirit, but also your capacity to work in unity is going to be mirrored into the heavenly realm. He also says that John 13 that you would love one another. A new commandment I give that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you would also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So I'm going, everybody knows that, but how do you do that? And I began to see that what God did on this seventh revelation about demonstration was that as all of these unfolded in my life, they had a threefold method, if you want to call it that, or an internal working method. And the first was God would lay, lay upon a truth upon my heart. All right, you've all had stuff that's been quickened to you from the scriptures. He would lay that truth and then he would teach me how to cultivate that truth till I owned it or till that it was personalized or till it was written on the tablet of my heart. And then lastly, he would tell me to go backwards and look to see if it really took. In other words, if you've had a genuine trans transformation on the inside, a genuine supernatural exchange, if you really are being changed, if you're better than you were last year and the year before that and the year before that, there should be subsequent fruit. Test it by the fruit because you're going to know them by the fruit. So it was a truth, a cultivation of that truth, and then the test by the fruit. Test it by the fruit. Do you see change in your life or not? But this last revelation added a dimension. And it said that if you did these things and if these things grew in you, if these things were applied and you walked in it, then from that point on, you're going to understand a fourth element, and that is proper motivation. Proper motivation. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love the kingdom of God. That's the proper motivation. But the how-to was you do these things and you will be motivated properly from the love of God. Then, like the Apostle Paul said, the love of God constraineth me or the love of God is controlling me. It's pressing me on all sides, eliminating any other option. That's going to require cultivation. And God basically used the word demonstration. It's enough, enough, enough lip service. It's time for demonstration. And demonstration means that you have a light witness that can display, that can demonstrate. And the fruit of it will be that something has changed in my life. I'm going to live out of this daily relationship, this become a supernatural expression. And God basically said, you know, uh, it teaches obedience out of the revelation that God gives you. Now, what did he say? First, 
Corinthians 4.20, because after this message is over, you say, I can't remember all of that, but I will remember 1 Corinthians 4.20. For he's basically said the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Say that back to me. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And that power to the Corinthians was not signs and wonders and gifts. It was moral power and excellence of soul. That can be reflected. Because remember, just doing the gifts of the Spirit isn't necessarily reflecting into the principality and power unless it changes lives, right? Because it says, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? And he said, I knew you not. Depart from me. You didn't mirror my character and my nature. You did not have excellence of soul, nor did you have moral power. You had gifting. So I believe what God is going to do with us, and I believe this is a, uh, this is a, a, a wonderful structure that I think he just kind of dropped into my spirit to, to help reveal. In the world, we call it boundaries. Do you understand that authority has boundaries? I want you to reach your maximum potential, but understanding your maximum potential will also mean I'm going to have to understand spiritual boundaries. Believe it or not, God has put some limitations. We limit him for the most part. So you probably don't hear much about limitations. But there are limitations when it comes to revelation, and I think we need to understand what they are. But our pursuit should be maximum potential for each and every one of us. So your level of revelation, this is this is spiritual boundaries. Your level of revelation, that means revelation where God quickens something to you. It's got life on it, not information, revelation. Your level of revelation will equal your spiritual authority or spiritual influence. All right, you with me so far? Your level of revelation will be proportional or equal your spiritual influence. I'm not talking about titles. I'm talking about your influence with God will be directly proportional to your level of revelation. If all you've got is a bunch of Bible knowledge, then your revelation level is low. And it's a boundary that you need to reach your maximum potential and start pursuing reality, start pursuing real knowledge, intimate knowledge. And the second level, your level of revelation will be equal to or proportional to your ability to hear. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying. And if you really want to see the way it's cultivated, look, uh, just uh, as, as Stephen gave that word, that's exactly what God was saying about Mark 4. How many know the parable of the soils? There's different kinds of hearts. The parable of the soil is heart condition. And that the word falls on various kinds of hearts. Some hearts are hard. Some are, have, are so all over the map that they're choked out by the cares of this world because as Cliff gave in, in that word, you know, basically their priorities are wrong. They love Jesus, but they love all these other things too. So Jesus kind of on an equal basis with these things. He was meant to be preeminent. He was not meant to be equal basis. Then you've got the scattered charms. You love everything, but not in the prioritized way. So your level of revelation will be equal to your capacity to hear. I want to say, God, remove hardness of heart, remove judgments, remove anything that prevents us from having a hearing ear. And quite frankly, you know, people think that uh, the Bible is complicated. You know who it's complicated to? The person whose heart's not right. If your heart's not right, it's very complicated. It'll look like apparent contradictions. It'll look like unnecessary uh, contradiction. You can interpret God as an evil, hard-hearted man. You could interpret it just about any way you wanted to if your heart's hard. You could interpret it as silliness. But God's basically saying your level of revelation or real knowledge, real knowledge, it's not head knowledge, real knowledge has to do and is proportional to your capacity to hear. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. God discipled me using Isaiah 50. And that was, I will awaken you morning by morning to awaken your ear. Awaken your ear. I could wake up. I wake up very slow, but I wake up eventually. Three coffees, and I'm up. No problem. 
But God was talking about awakening your ear, and that's a totally different concept. That means I have to arouse, incite to action, just like a mother eagle hovers over its nest to instill destiny into those little eaglets. It's almost like I've got to arouse that inner you, that real you, to emerge and come forth and draw into a relationship with me. I need to tease you and draw you and incite you to action. I need to quicken arouse, wake up. We're talking about a, the advent of an awakening. I'll tell you what, you've got an opportunity right now to wake up out of your slumber. One thing about sleeping is you don't know you're asleep until you wake up. And it's usually a rude awakening when you get up, right? Something, something terrible like an alarm clock that shocks you into it. Well, I want to be a semi-prepared for any shock and that is the closer I get to God, the more prepared I am for any kind of disturbance. But it's a boundary. You establish that boundary. You set that boundary. You can have as much revelation as your capacity to hear. You're not going to get more revelation than your ability to hear. Your level of revelation, here's a hard one for people. I don't know why it's so hard, but it is. Your level of revelation will be equal to your gift and your calling. It's a boundary. I didn't establish that. God established that. Your level of revelation pertains to your jurisdiction. Your gifts and calling put you in a place where revelation flows differently. The one that, where I would see this violated from, from a pastoral point of view would be when a pastor... Uh, interjects himself into somebody's family without being invited. That's a violation of a boundary. What would the boundary be? The parents are responsible. That's their jurisdiction. You need to invite an authority. However, it works the other way too. When a person in a congregation thinks they got better revelation than five-fold ministers, that's a form of deception. Because God placed the body. He didn't... Everybody can prophesy, but not everybody's a prophet. And God placed in the body apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. And if you're not going to get better revelation in their jurisdiction for direction. I'm going to say that again, for direction. In other words, God has placed the foundation of apostles and prophets particularly not only for, to train and to give the work of the ministry, but everyone is, should pursue Christ-likeness. Do you agree? I don't care. If you've got a title, no title. It means nothing to me. Christ-likeness. That Christ be formed in me. Paul said, oh, I labor again that Christ be formed in you. Everyone. That's dimensional revelation, for lack of a better word. I don't know how to explain this. Dimensional. As much as Jesus as you want. That is for every believer. But then there is also directional revelation where God will hold a leader accountable for the direction in which he takes a congregation or a group, just like a mother and a father will be held accountable for the direction that they take their children. But a household does not have directional revelation over fivefold ministry. Why that's complicated, I don't know, because there's usually armchair experts that always think they have a better revelation for the church than the leader. But in reality, it's interesting because they won't stand before the Lord for it, and they want, they're taking authority without responsibility. People like that. Authority without responsibility. Now, if your level of revelation is determined by your gift and calling, then basically there is even within that, there are those, this answered a question for me, is I felt from the time I got saved that God had called me to the body at large, but I knew I would pastor. I love pastoring. But he basically said, you're called to the body at large. But for the first 18 years as a pastor, I never left my church in Pennsylvania. I never went anywhere and always wondered even felt guilty at times, like, why is my heart out there when I'm to be responsible in here? But then in the fullness of time, God explained that. It's just because it's both. But I took my sweet old time about getting you out there. But knowing that it's both, 
settled something in the inside. It was understanding your jurisdiction. Now, for me, it was understanding the frustration of the jurisdiction because I was in one place for 18 years and not out there, yet the yearning was that there's out there. And then the very first time I did a strictly pastor's conference, I felt like a cowboy in the saddle. And this is what I was made for. And it was like, it, it fit. And God wants you to find where you fit. He wants you to realize that there is a supernatural expression for you, but you need that fit. In the old days, we used to kick people out of the church. I still do. Right, right, Glenn? Tomatoes belong in tomato patches. Watermelons belong in watermelons. And I have everybody in, in total confusion. Like, does he tell me I shouldn't be here? Does he tell me? I'm, I don't know if I'm a tomato or if I'm a watermelon. I don't know. But you know what? You need to know where you fit. When you get married, for heaven's sakes, you need to find a, a husband or a wife that you fit. All right? Fit. That's not a bad word. That means these are the people that God put together. Do you know where you belong even? I'll tell you what. If you don't know who you are, where you live, or what you do for a living, if you were in the hospital in an emergency room, they'd keep you. They wouldn't let you go home because you don't know who you are, where you live, or what you do for a living. How much more in, in the kingdom of God should we be able to answer these questions? The last level of revelation is your level of revelation will be directly proportional to the size of your group or the size, it says it better, to the size of your heart. Jabez said, increase my boundaries. I see that as a heart prayer more than just material boundary increases. I saw that the heart has to go with the responsible enlargement. If you have enlargement without an enlargement of heart, you're destined to fall. I believe that enlargement of heart. Now, I've heard others teach that, you know, uh, God put men over, over tens, over fifties, over hundreds, over two hundreds, and that's their calling. But also, God has put people over whether they're for a local group or they're the body of Christ at large. It's a big difference. And you need to understand your boundaries. Otherwise, you're trying to be something you're not. Is that true? If you don't understand boundaries, you're trying to be something you're not. And I'm concerned is what you are, is it reflecting? Is it mirroring into the heavenly places a transformed life that is pleasing to God? Because as he is to us, so are we in this world. You're mirroring what he has reflected on your heart that has taken, that has changed, that has transformed. That's a supernatural transaction. Now, now I want to get into the levels of prophetic revelation. And I'm sure that this is not a conclusive thing, but I believe it will establish some boundaries for us. First of all, just as a new creation, you've got to fall in love with the fact that he is with us at all times. Anyone that suffers from rejection or loneliness, you need to deal with that. And God's more than willing to deal with that, but he is with us. He will never leave you or forsake you. If you can't get a foundation on that reality, you're going you're gonna to flounder in the deeper things of God. I will never leave you or forsake you. He is with us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? I know the, the prophetic is split pretty much in a couple of camps of doom and gloom and uh, extreme optimism and obviously the truth will probably be the tension between two extremes but my concern is not whether it's doom and gloom or whether it's extreme optimism my problem is that am I in a place that God is for me who can be against me because it's about transformed lives means a testimony and a testimony is not a testimony unless there's been a test so whether it's uh, with a uh, uh, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Gross darkness covers the earth. But arise, shine, for your light has come. That's the way it should be. I'm, I'm not going to focus just on the darkness that's coming to the earth, and I'm not going to get into false optimism to where it's just good, good, good. It's basically, no, there's going to be resistance in this world, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And if God is for me, who can be against me? All I need is to know the strategy to come against uh, the things I need to come against and overcome, really, the things I need to overcome. 
So God is with us. He's for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? He's going to come to us like the rain and the latter and the former rain and the earth. He's going to come to us. So there's always enough measure and availability of him if we will inquire of him and make him our vital necessity. In other words, first things first. Again, like Cliff said, priority. He's preeminent. If he's not preeminent, you're going to have trouble with that because he will come to you like the rain and the, uh, the latter and the former rain to the earth. And what does he ultimately want to do after he comes to us? He wants to get through us. He's with us. He's for us. He's to us. He wants to get through us on earth as it is in kingdom. And as he is, so are we in this world that God is basically trying to work through us. Now, this living sacrifice. Now I want to cover these five levels. If you're not a note taker, you're going to be real sorry later because you're not going to be able to remember this and this will transform your life because these levels will become a boundary for you to reach your maximum potential and not get off into something that's not yours. All right? Level number one. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Level number one, is not what we want? Level number one, I actually learned level number one is inner revelation. In the natural, we're flesh. Revelation only comes through the spirit. Only our spirit can receive and function spiritual things. It must be quickened or lifted above earthly things. Uh, we have one of our instructors who say, if the world can do it, God's not in it. Because the goal of revelation or real relationship means it needs to be lifted above the flesh. It needs to be lifted into a spirit dimension. Quicken me according to your word. And God has given me the tongue of a disciple that I would know how to speak a word in season. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear. Quicken is to make alive, to endure with life, to empower with life. But that includes mind, will, and emotions have to be impacted by that. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us what? Alive. Alive together by the grace we have been saved. You who are dead in sins, he made alive together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses. All right? Level number one is how much revelation you have just simple revelation of how much God quickens to you, how much that what he quickens to you is basically going to be how much influence you're going to have because he wants you to influence the world around you for the good. He wants you to be a redemptive people, but only to the degree that you get words quickened to you. So when you say, I'm not hearing nothing, I'm not getting nothing, that's an indictment against your relationship. Everyone should have something to say at any given moment. Because this relationship was not meant to be something that you put, up, you put Jesus out on the front porch and then when you're not busy with other stuff, you ask him to come in and have a relationship. I tried that with Jennifer. I'd be, I'd, I'd be beat up. I'd be looking out of one eye. All right, Jennifer, uh, go stand on the front porch until I decide we want to have some relationship. All right, That wouldn't last long. But you know what? She's a lot like John. I close the door, she'd fling the door open and she'd say, I'm coming in. You're mine. She might, I have a ring that proves it. She says, I'm my beloved's and he belongs to me. We're going to have relationship. Hmm? Passion in the relationship. We need to have the passion that John had to pursue him. So level number one is basically that we're going to have to understand quickening. How many understand when a word is quickened to you that it's got a little bit more life than the rest of the total concept of God, the whole counsel of God? You're going to, the first step that he taught me with revelation was that you just don't get all excited about it and blurt it out because then it's merely information. It could even have an anointing on it, but it's information. What he told me was treat it as if, he, actually he used a little girl that was... Um, they used to get on the bus, and she was, she was uh, slow mentally, and she was going to school, and uh, it was so precious because they're so innocent and they're so loving. They're like the rest of people should be. And her prized possession 
was a little, one of those little miniature boxes of raisins. And I mean, going to school with those raisins was everything to her. But when she loved somebody, like the bus driver, she would give the bus driver her box of raisins. And I'm saying, if we could translate that into adult mentality, then when God gave you a revelation or a quickening, you didn't treat it like it's just another word. You would take it to heart as out of all the grains of the sands of the sea, God chose this one granule to present it to me. It's choice. When you start treating the word like it's the pearl of great price and that it's precious. When I taught Jennifer to meditate, I use the word precious all the time because it, revelation to me is precious. And it's like God out of the out of the whole counsel of God, took that one scripture. It's got to be the most precious, needful thing in my life right now. If there was something more needful, he would have given it to me. But no, he gave me that portion of scripture. And so I would take that revelation until it changed, till I felt like I owned it, till I felt like it was properly appreciated and absorbed and assimilated into my life at some level. Then I felt like, Revelation number one, that I honored it because I wanted not the information, but I wanted to be a partaker of the divine nature because I knew that it's moral power and excellence of soul that speaks as an expression better than information. Because you can give secondhand revelation from anybody. If you, you don't own it, it doesn't have the excellence of soul, nor does it have moral power coming from you. So, quicken me, O God, according to your word. That's what David said in Psalm 119, verse 25. Quicken me according to your word. It's the spirit that gives life or quickens. It's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. All right? So, that's level number one. And many people get so excited when they get level one, they get into performance mode and they've got to blurt it out and they think that's the end of it. I got it, I said it. And you will stay at a very low level of relationship if you think that's what it's all about. I got it, I said it, there, I'm done. The second level is testimony. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When revelation is owned and it's changed your mind, your will, and your emotion, you have a testimony. Now listen to me because you can have been in the church a long time and you think you know what testimony is. But I want to tell you, I was an advisor to women's and men's uh, groups where people were called upon to give their testimonies. And there was a high percentage that gave a testimony that was not a testimony. They gave coping as a badge of virtue or accomplishment. Like, uh, uh, thank God that I got through my husband's ordeal with cancer. Well, I'm glad you got through that ordeal with cancer, but tell, well, while you're talking, I still feel the pain on those words. That means there has not been a spiritual transformation. The pain is indicating that you coped. Thank God you made it through. Thank God you survived some horrific situations in your life, but it's not a testimony yet. It's a testimony when you can talk about it from the place of peace. I was listening real careful. Of course, he probably knows that. But when Jason was given his testimony, and he was talking about some of those difficult situations that he went through, to where, he, uh, where the woman that had blood all over, and he had to basically carry her bloody body to the point that there were times where he could not go to a grocery store in the meat center and smell the blood, all right? But while he was talking about it, it was totally anointed. There was no pain. There was no sorrow. There was no residue of our lack of transformation because I've seen people that would talk about that stuff, but they were in pain talking about it. That's not a testimony. A testimony is until you pass the test and the actual test for revelation is when it changed you. You're not saved unless you're changed. And you're not sanctified unless it's changed. And that word has not taken root in you and established in you until you're changed. If the word doesn't change you, what good is it? 
Many, many are exalted with their knowledge of the word, but they should be exalted in the fact that the word changed their life and they're mirroring back to the heavenly places. The principalities of power say, devil, look at that. Jesus is being reflected from my life because he changed me. It's a testimony, level two of real revelation, of the real prophetic, by the way. Uh, all you prophetic people, listen to this. Real prophetic is a life change, not the ability to prophesy. Did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? I knew you not. Always tuck that in the back and never get exalted because of your gifting, because you can operate in your gifting and you could be saying nothing to principalities and powers. A manifold wisdom of God would be declared through the church, but you can't shine something heavenward to the devils or to the angels aren't going to rejoice. They will with salvation, won't they? Will the angels rejoice with salvation? Why? Because their life changed. They can see a transformation. They say, Poof! They've got Jesus in them now. There's transformation. If something in your life doesn't have transformation, you're not mirroring anything of real value, no matter how religious you are, no matter how diligent you are. Testimony means you pass the test and there's a changed life. It has nothing to do with your title or your gifting. I am not impressed with gifting. Actually, the church has been embarrassed by people who have great gifting, but their behavior is embarrassment. That's got to stop. God's saying you've got to take it to a higher level and understand the boundaries. You're only, you need to know that it's a testimony. And that means your mind, will, and emotions. There is no transformation or renewal of the mind that doesn't include the mind, the will, and the emotions. And thereby, true testimony is spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity and emotional maturity are one and the same. You cannot have spiritual maturity. The better way to say that is you cannot have spiritual maturity without emotional maturity, right? I might not talk to these people over here because they, they get ignored. Everybody thinks I'm talking to Tom and Jason and go ahead here. All right. Third, he wants your entire mindset, Romans 12, to testimony. Level three, Prophecy. What is the purpose of prophecy? It's for the purpose of divine communication. If anyone speaks, let them speak as the oracles of God. Prophecy, since the 80s, has come to the forefront so that everyone all can prophesy. Do you believe that? All can prophesy. All can prophesy is for divine communication, and it should comfort it should edify, it can correct, but even when it corrects, it better have the love nature of God behind it because our Father corrects in love. When God basically speaks a prophetic word, all of us, if anyone ministers, let them do it with the ability that God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through it. If God gives you a quickened word and you speak and you prophesy, then you're prophesying that word. It's to edify, to comfort, to build up, to encourage, to incite to action, to even stimulate some, some divine attributes within people. And it causes to ignite, at least gives them the chance to say, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be challenged to move forward and upward? Everybody can do it. All should seek to do it. However, that third level, that third level is just that. It's for everybody. The fourth level is the office of a prophet. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Fivefold ministers, not everyone is. All can prophesy, but not everybody's a prophet, right? Not everybody's an apostle, not everybody's a pastor or a teacher. When God basically speaks a specific word in a specific place at a specific time, a prophet speaks for God as his mouthpiece. Standing, they can give both correctional and directional words. It's a limited ministry, and it's distinctly different from the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 12 says, are all prophets? No. But this 
gift can be done and a man can stand in the office of prophet and then minimize his own character development. But the gifts and the callings are without repentance so he could keep functioning, right? It's to comfort, to edify, and to correct. All right? But here is what I believe God is wanting even more so. If five full ministers do their job, you could teach them all to prophesy, to get comfortable prophesying. But I am totally convinced that what God is making ready a people for is for a spirit of prophecy or the fifth element. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But what made, what made, what made the testimony of Jesus the spirit of prophecy? What made it? It's that he didn't have any word that he didn't live. So his very existence was the spirit of prophecy. I only do what I hear my father doing. I only say what I hear. And his function and his obedience in destiny. He knew his destination and he fulfilled his destiny. And in doing that, he was the embodiment by the words that he spoke and by the life that he lived and by the death that he died. I'm talking even the death that he died into the flesh during his life, which is harder than just the physical death on the cross, which was clearly supreme. But the spirit of prophecy is the highest realm, and it functions through relationship rather than a gift. Say that back, because this is the mandate of Full Stature Ministries, Kingdom Life Church. The spirit of prophecy demands relationship, not gifting. Did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? Depart from me, I knew you not. The highest, God is impressing us that he wants us to own it to such a degree, the revelation that he gives it to us, that we begin to enter into the unity, the love. These need to be the, 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 the structure or the boundaries, that if we don't cooperate with those boundaries, we don't want nothing to do with unity. We don't want nothing to do with loving people. I just love God. These people are all crazy. All right. God I love is these people I can't say. None of that is going to tie in to make your life a spirit of prophecy. To be a testimony. Of, isn't that interesting? The testimony of Jesus. What's a testimony? That he was in total transformation. He even learned wisdom by the things that he suffered. In other words, every test became a testimony. So his entire life was a testimony. That's the kind of prophecy we need. One that is birthed out of, say this with me, because this is the part, if you miss this, you miss the whole thing. It's, it's birthed out of relationship, not gifting. It's birthed out of relationship, not gifting. Because then, and this is what the Lord's saying, I asked you to plant Kingdom Life Church. And Kingdom Life Church, as opposed to traveling church to church, was to be a prototype of being an expression. And you know what? There's a whole lot of people that just want church as usual or they want it under the old trappings of what they're accustomed to and familiar with and they insist on operating the way they want to. But that's not what God called me to do. I didn't pick it, by the way. This is not my idea. I didn't pick it. He said, I want a prototype of what you did when you travel. And what we did when we traveled was we want a transfigured fullness people, a supernatural transformation to where... Your gifting is coming out of relationship, not out of gifting. I am not impressed with your gifting. I don't care about your gifting if your character is in question. If the character is in question, do you know how many people like to hide their character issues and then almost immediately project they want to talk Bible talk? Have you ever been in a, in a home group or something where someone wanted to be knowledgeable? They're hiding behind their knowledge because they don't really want intimacy and they don't really want to be known by the Spirit. They want to put up that barrier. And God's saying, I'm, I'm establishing boundaries and my boundary is transformation. The only wall should be the peace of God. And the only way you have the peace of God as a wall is if Jesus is Lord. Then the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. And God is about to break greater and lesser knittings together. And it's not going to be based on your gifting. He's going to bring greater and lesser knittings together so that we can mirror. 
the bottom line, what God is saying, is this fifth level of relational expression over our gifting, though it includes gifting, is that the spirit of prophecy expresses a life that has become a witness of the Lord, not merely a witness for the Lord. A witness of the Lord, not a witness for the Lord. You can be a witness for the Lord. You can go door to door and God didn't even send you door to door. You can go door to door, but it's mirroring nothing in the heavenlies. That was, your, that was uh, of your own making. It was not a leading of the Spirit. It was not walking in the works that he prepared beforehand. It was works that you picked and chose. But as we become in union with him, our lives become a mirror that reflects the person and the presence of the Lord Jesus. The testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, will be both seen and heard as we mirror him. The Lord desires to bring overcomers into this level of relationship in which the spirit of prophecy will become a creative force that will greatly affect the world in the outworking of the end times purposes of God. After God gave me over that six month period, those seven life changing encounters, the seventh one was demonstration that the kingdom of God will not come with word. It will come in demonstration of the spirit and power. And that demonstration of the spirit and power is not just signs and wonders. It's moral, ex it's moral power and excellence of soul. Until there is a transfigured fullness, people, the gifting is only part of it. And who would you trust that gifting with the best? I believe there's going to be giftings that are going to flourish in the days ahead. But God is looking for people he can trust to increase that level. Because some, it would just go to their head. So we're going to become that mirror. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to principalities and powers. What he once mirrored or reflected to principalities and powers, that's to demons. Aha, this is the victory. We're a sweet fragrance of life mirroring the transformation. But we're also testifying to the angels of God in heaven who are rejoicing. And the Lord is sitting in heaven and laughs at the wrath and the heathens as they rage against. Because he is with us. He is for us. If, and if he's for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. These are going to be things that are going to be part and parcel of a people who are walking more in a transfigured fullness life than rather than the, uh, the badge of gifting. Everyone that can prophesy thinks, sometimes thinks they're a prophet going somewhere. And quite frankly, they're usually going somewhere to be an accident because the two things that threaten their maturity is any kind of unity and any kind of love for other people. I can, that was my first lesson as a baby Christian. I was in a church and I saw a whole church full of people that couldn't stand each other but they were the number one church in giving to missions. And I said, how interesting. And the Lord said, yeah, because they love those people they never met. <laughs> they can't live with the people in the room. That's the problem. But they love those people in Africa that they never met. And sometimes they wanted to starve out the pastor, so the board made sure all the money went to missions. So they were the number one. And I'm saying, but they're despicable in their heart attitude. <laughs> you can be number one in God's idea. You're not number one with me. You think you're rich, and you know, I think you're poor and naked, right? Does God talk like that? Yeah. He, he sure does, and he talks like that to the church. So, Father, we thank you that this is the day that we are going to become a supernatural expression and that we're going to move through those five elements, but we're also going to honor the boundaries that have been established. Remember, it's not really unlimited potential. It's reaching your maximum potential because there are limitations, and that has to do with your jurisdiction. When we went church to church, I sat with groups of pastors and they say, what is the essence of what you're seeing going church to church? Because they're curious, especially if they don't go church to church. I saw, and I remembered it, J-A-D-A. -A. I'm just to memorize it because it was so repetitive. One, failure to understand jurisdiction. And in that jurisdiction, I saw people abdicating rather than adjudicating. 
they were abdicating instead of Jews. They didn't know their jurisdiction, but when they did know their jurisdiction, they were abdicating. God gave me this job. Oh, God gave me this job. They go on the job two weeks. God wants me to quit. Now, why did he send you there? Is, 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 he changed his mind. So jurisdiction was the number one problem. Boundaries is what the world would call it. Don't know their jurisdiction. Just keep your nose in your own jurisdiction. There's certain decisions that your boss makes, he makes them without inquiring of you. And so what you have a tendency to do, and this is erroneous, you fill in what you don't know with a guess. And you could be dangerous. Jurisdiction, adjudication. The day's coming when we're going to triumph over everything. Greater is he that's in us and he is in the world is going to be our battle cry. Right now we don't even talk about that scripture. We're too busy hanging in there but it's because we're adju- we're not adjudicating we're abdicating j a d real spiritual warfare has to do with displacement i am convinced that some of the ugly things that i see when there's a pattern uh that needs to be dealt with whether it's in the church or in your home or in the community or what have you displacement is still the power of God. What God says basically, you bring the nature and the character of me and through loving intercession, and I will displace the enemy until it rises up to where you become a governing factor in that jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, adjudication, displacement, and then advancement. You don't really advance until you've occupied and and overcome to some degree, right? And God's saying, I want to bring it into the place of advancement. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. There's a need to bring advancement. How many have the five areas? Anybody take the note that I miss one? Hmm? Revelation. Hmm? Revelation for information. Inner revelation. Secondly, level two is when it's a testimony or transformation. And that's really where I'd like to take the whole church to that second level before you get off and implement. The third level is moving in the gifts of the Spirit of prophecy with the intent to be redemptive, to comfort, edify, and encourage mostly. Mostly. Comfort, encourage, edify. I haven't seen anybody die from encouragement yet. It's not like they're getting too much of it. So you could be an instrument to be an encourager and comforter. However, why do I feel so strongly about being a, make sure it's a testimony before you go prophesy and just flaunting your gift? It's because comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted. You can't give them a level of comfort that you yourself don't walk in. You can give them the right information. You might give them a little gifting, a little tickle of gifting, I don't want a little tickle of gifting. I want substance. If you're going to bring a word of comfort to me and it's something I can receive, you better have it to give. If you don't have it to give, I'm not going to really get it. I'll go get it myself with Jesus. <laughs> All right. Because you can't give something you yourself have never received. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you are comforted in your difficult time. But if you were never comforted, if you were never brought to the place of peace in your difficult time, you don't really have anything to offer. And yet in the Old Testament, when Bill Morford did his study, he says, I found three anohi. All the rest of I am, I am, anohi. There's three anohis that are different. And that was in the book of Isaiah. And the anohis was I am, I am, and I've got an attitude about this. I am your Savior, and there's none beside me. So much for the many roads to God, right? I am, I am, and I've got an attitude, I am your forgiver, and nobody can wash away sin but me. I am, I am your comforter, and everything is a false comfort but what I give. Nobody can give comfort except me. But you can't give it to someone else if you don't have it. That's sympathy and that patronage. I mean, you could do that with hospice, really. Hospice can comfort the person, but there's no spiritual value to it, right? Don't they go into homes when someone's terminal and they, quote, comfort? That's not the comfort I'm talking about. That won't work. That's nice, but it won't work. The comfort that God wants you to give is a comfort that's supernatural. 
And if you don't have it, you can't give it. Can't give something you don't have. So God's basically saying that that's the third level. The fourth level is basically understanding that there is an authority and structure. And if you've got authority problems, that's your problem. But God's not going to change because you have authority problems. <laughs> he places in the body authorities in both government, in the church, in the home, and in business. You know, and if you don't believe it, go in and yell at your boss. Tell him off. See if that works. Hmm? You don't call your boss on the carpet, do you? And you don't call pastors on the carpet? Children don't call their parents on the carpet? I've seen it. <laughs> right? That's not going to work. That's a character flaw. It's a serious character flaw, and you're, it's going to hold you back from being all that God wants you to be. How many, how many, have, how many have heard children say, I hate you? Hmm? They're going to reap from that. They're going to reap from that. I used to get smacked when my youngest boy didn't get, you know, everybody's going to be looking at Jason, when my youngest boy got a bad grade or didn't do his homework, I walked in and he'd give me a swag. I'm going, what are you doing? He goes, you didn't help me with my homework. It was my fault. All right? But don't think adults don't do the same thing. It's my boss's fault. It's the pastor's fault. It's my father's fault. It's my mother's fault. Right? That's, the, that's who you blame. But guess what? Jesus said the entire kingdom of God has destroyed the blame game. The blame game is over and that you are obligated to think redemptively with repentance and forgiveness. So there's no wiggle room for anybody. We all need to change. Do you agree? All right. Now, we're going to see how much you agree. This is a good time for you to come up and tell me what part affected you to facilitate change. What part are you going to take home and work on? And it's no fair saying, I know someone who needs this. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I guess. Um, kind of along the lines what people were sharing um, with the soils is I began through a... Anyways, through a host of things, I just began to realize um, there were things in my heart and I just began asking the Lord, you know, what are these? And in the end, um, the Lord showed me that it was harlotry, that I began to look for all these other things to fill the need about predominance that I was filling, trying to have my husband love me, love me. But really, this wasn't his place this isn't any human place or our job or our material things or whatever it is but what that was doing was that was creating um rocks in my soil and um so as the lord was taking me on this journey i think the first thing was admitting to myself you know i have the heart of a harlot i am looking to all these other things to fill my life when in reality the highest thing needs to be the Lord. And, and that was just, for me, true repentance. But then beyond that, there were, there were the rocks and just letting the Lord go into that. And um, I think what I'm going to be taking is I think just can the Lord... I had a dream last night um, that was just a huge block to my who I am in the Lord. And um, it was a little scary. <laughs> but um, as I was praying and just kind of opening my spirit, I saw who I am. And underneath all of this, you know, whatever it is. Oh, I know it is. But anyways, and, and I was like, I mean, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> and I just think as we, or, right. you know, for me, and what I'm going to be taking is beginning to drill down and, and let the Lord beginning to remove this. I mean, really, I mean, it was fear. It was this massive, bountiful fear um, that was stopping me from 
that was stopping the Lord from being in me. And so I guess taking this and, and saying, this is whatever the Lord's given me, I'm not going to get to my jurisdiction. I'm not going to get to what God has for me until I, this That's person right. down here, until I am able to be r risen up and, th and through all of this. But I guess as far as even encouragement, mm -hmm. the first thing for me was admitting, hey, I have all these other gods that I'm looking for to fill my life and to fill the needs that are within me because then God can never come and fill. And even mm -hmm. when, you know, I'm like, oh, Jason, I just wish. It's like, no, let the Lord fill that area in my life. So, okay, I'm sorry. I want I'll him. be quiet. I want him, oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's very good. What Mandy, my interpretation of what Mandy is saying as well is I'm convinced that with all the teachings on the seven mountains, that if we don't deal with the seven mountains within, if you don't win the battle within, your jurisdiction in the seven mountain, your character won't keep you. When Dennis was speaking, it, the pictures, I mean, it just kept coming over and over and in the, in the, the nature on it was, was when Peter, you know, finally went back to the boat, took all the disciples, and Jesus came. He had to fish there with the, and uh, so he brought Peter back to the shore you know, Peter was kind of discouraged because it didn't all go like he thought it was going to go. And um, w when he said, Peter, do you love me? And he asked him the three times. What, what he was doing, you know, th what the Lord showed me for me, he was taking him into the reality of the place that he was really at. In other words, you know, I've put up walls and pretend and, 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 he's, and he's just continually knocking all those walls down. And, and bringing me to a place to say, this is where you're really at. This is where you're really at, Jason. Don't, you know, uh, it, it's great because all those walls are religious things that I put up to to bolster who, who I was. It wasn't really who I was. So God has, you know, has been taking all those things down. Now he's saying, you know, you know, Peter was, he's saying, do you love me? And then Peter, he's bringing him to the state of love that he really had which is where I'm really at. And now he's saying to me, Jason, now go feed my sheep. You know, go feed my sheep, and I'm going to take you in a way. Uh, basically, I'm going to, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to die. You're going to give your life. You know, I, when I say die daily is what I'm, you know, who knows what will happen then. But um, so I know that's my road. And, and uh, if, if to equate it with the message um, is, you know, continuing that transformation and then learning how to, you know, apply that transformation out to others, I guess is the best way to say it. Okay. Tom. I'll hold the microphone. Whatever they're preachers, I don't. Uh, go ahead. Um, I could have used your information about 37 years ago. <laughs> I still need it, but uh, the part about the jurisdiction and the authority, um, I really had some experiences with this where I've really botched it up. But not only did I botch it up, I thought the other people were at fault. Um, I had a couple of different um, television programs that I hosted and I was ministering in different places, but um, there were times when I'd go into a church when I wasn't invited there. I just happened to be there and was part of the, uh, the, the, the congregation. Uh, but when I would have a, a prophetic word, there were times when I actually spoke out the prophetic word and it wasn't received. And um, it, at first, I, I, I began to get uh, upset with those people, not only the congregation, but the pastor who didn't seem to appreciate the fine, fine word that I brought. <laughs> um, after a while, I began to understand what you're teaching now about the fact that I didn't have jurisdiction in that place. And there were times where there were some of those churches didn't even believe in prophetic words and other times <laughs> that'll make a difference uh, other times even the churches where they were a charismatic or a Pentecostal sort of church 
Um, I wasn't necessarily recognized. Um, some of those churches actually have um, a team of people that sit in a certain place or are recognized just throughout the congregation by the, the pastor, and the pastor will call on somebody or invite the, the prophetic team in turn to come and give a word of, of prophecy. But here I was as a visitor in the back of the row or something, standing up and speaking a word. Um, so I was out of place. Well, because I didn't know these things back then and I didn't have you to teach me, uh, I, I got angry with those people, the, the people and the pastor, and I thought there was something wrong with them. Um, to understand that God has order and God um, has his way of doing things is so important. So the, the, the part about understanding authority, understanding jurisdiction, and flowing with that. Uh, there's a lot of times since then that after God taught me these things that I've had a prophetic word um, and I've learned to keep my mouth shut because that's it wasn't my place or time to do it. So I appreciate you. Part about expression and what we're expressing and even the level that God is taking us to um, to have Christ formed in us to express him. There's time for, for a birthing of the fullness of Christ to be expressed through his body. And I believe that's what God is preparing us for in this place. So be the expression. But it has to be out of a reality in us. And I'm seeing God do like a stripping away of unreality, of playing the game of church, of... Um, rituals, traditions, um, just anything that's anything that's fake or anything that's pretend. So just really, really crying out in my prayer time every day, a longing. Our, we have inherited the full work of the cross to cut off everything that came from Adam and to, to um, that God really bring gift of repentance and the true death, because the true death of the cross leads ultimately to the prize of the throne in Revelation 3.20. And just reality, the reality of him expressed in me is what I long for. And the reality of him expressed through a group of unified people in the last two Sundays. I've seen, I've seen for several years now, I've seen a throne and I've seen Jesus standing by the throne off and on. And the last two Sundays, I saw him come and take his seat in this place. And when he did that, the glory of God and the fire of God filled this place. And the light of God and the love of God filled this place. So the part of expression and not to fear the death of the cross because that's really the entryway into the, the, into the heavenly realm. What the Lord showed me is when he is telling me things, revealing things to me, to go deeper with them, not just for that moment, just the how spectacular it was, but to cultivate it and to go back to it and just, I mean, like search out and just mine it and just keep going and going. And that that would help bring transformation to me. And then because he did this transformation, I then could go out and help to transform like with him and me doing that. Very good. Very good. You're off the hook now. And the rest of you. I don't know. But you know what? I like what Tom said. I mean, uh, Jason. I like what you said, too. But uh, all right, what Jason said about it. I like it when you get to see where you're really at. Or was that, was that Mandy? I don't know. But it's, it's really healthy to see where you're really at. You know, Jesus, you know, where I'm really at. He's not out to punish you and condemn you, but it's very important to see where am I really at because then you can truly go up to a higher level. You can't go up to a higher level if you, you're fooling yourself or, or busy trying to fool other people where you're at. You can't go higher. So, Father, we just pray that you who began a good work are continuing that good work and that we will be a prototype of a people that will demonstrate a redemptive love toward other people and that we will have a semblance of unity. It'll never be perfect, 
but you know, just a heart attitude, the attitude of unity, to just somehow that upper room got in one accord with before the Holy Spirit fell, before the Holy Spirit. So at some level, I don't know what that is, but an adequate witness. I'm asking God that our prayers is that we would become an adequate witness of the kinds of things that would be, uh, that would reflect your love and your nature to principalities and powers. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.